everyone. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Thank you guys for coming to the validators panel. Uh, my name is Sunny Agarwal, and I'm currently a uh, core developer and researcher on uh, the Cosmos project. Uh, so we've been doing a lot. I've done a lot of like the uh, d architecture and design for the uh, staking side of a lot of what Cosmos is doing. So you know, I've been thinking a lot from like about like what validators want to do and whatnot. And so now it would be great for me to like hear from the validators themselves. So um, would the rest of you uh, like to introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, can you start up? Sure. I'm Tim Ogilvy. I run Staked. Uh, we run validator nodes on behalf of typically institutional investors, brand name funds. We run across, uh, currently we're live on four chains and we'll be live by roughly 10 chains by the end of the year. Hey guys, my name is Joe, uh, one of the founding members of Eon Staking Partners. Uh, we are building a staking on-ramp uh, for retail and institutional investors um, and supporting network infrastructure uh, along the way. Hey, I'm Adrian. I'm one of the co-founders of Cryptium Labs, um, a validator that spawned out of the Cosmos project, really. Um, so some of you may know me for my work on Cosmos. And so that's sort of how this all started, because we needed validators for Cosmos, and I very much got involved with how we can run validators for Cosmos. Um, currently, Cryptium Labs is live on Tezos and running test nets for Cosmos, Polkadot. Yeah, that's it. Uh, my name is Zaki Manian. I do a sort of run R&D at Tendermint that's creating Cosmos. And I also have a validator called Occlusion that I run with a partner. Um, we're sort of, we're live on the Cosmos test nets and probably going to add some more networks in the future. Cool. And um, also just for context, I'm also running a validator called Sika, but uh, I'll try to remain neutral during the panel as a moderator. Um, okay. so. Uh, let's just start off right off the bat. Like, what even are validators? Like, uh, you know, are they specifically something for proof of stake, or is it is it a more broad term? There's this terminology called like master nodes that has been around for like years. What's like the relationship? Is it essentially close to the same thing? How are they different? Um, yeah, whoever whoever like to take that. Mm, right. So like, validators. Uh, so like, when I think about validator, I think about like the only problem set of validator is solving is secure and available cryptographic keys to provide digital signatures. Like that's the entire thing a validator is, um, right? Because you have to keep some keys that are used for consensus signing. They are usually very applicable to proof of stake networks uh, and sort of fulfill the security functions of proof of stake networks. But there's nothing to say that validators couldn't also become a term that sort of describes trusted oracles where. Um, like where they start providing, let's say, weather, authenticated weather data into uh, numerous chains, because it's essentially fundamentally the same problem of available and secure cryptographic keys. It's like that's what I think about validators. So, sort of the emergence of validators is sort of this um, creation of a new role in the cryptographic economy. So, like we've had service providers like exchanges, we've had miners. We've had uh, wallet providers. Validators are kind of like a new, a new piece of the puzzle. Um, and so like Adrian described like what is unique about a validator, which is a secure and available cryptographic key. So given a secure and available cryptographic key, like what, is the what does that infrastructure look like? It, it looks like the infrastructure for higher throughput networks. It looks like the um, infrastructure for, you know, how do you have uh, distributed ledgers that don't involve mining? All of those pieces, it looks like oracles, um, and so I think that the like the reason why all of us are interested in this business is it's sort of this emerging opportunity that we have these networks that now support this functionality, and it's important. And like we're we're sort of interested in realizing sort of the economic opportunity on top of it. So would you say that like the economic opportunity on like getting in on staking now, like we're just seeing this year, we see a lot of uh, proof of stake blockchains emerging. Would it be like similar to being like a miner in the early days of Bitcoin, like just jumping right into that? Yeah, I think the big difference between mining and, and staking is that mining is external to the network. And so some external miner is going to create new blocks. With staking, you, if you hold a, a proof of stake currency, can earn effectively an interest rate by voting for valid validators and people who are going to do that job correctly. And so it creates a real economic opportunity for not just the folks on the stage, but everyone in this room, to the extent you hold something, you can earn an interest rate on it um, by, by choosing wisely. 
Yeah, um, just to touch on that, I totally agree. Um, the, it, it sort of democratizes uh, security um, for everyone, and, and the inflation rate gets to uh, be distributed in a more um, equitable manner amongst all the stakeholders in the network, rather than just you know a couple entities that are like consolidating hash power and colluding. So, um, you know, there will be issues like that down the line, obviously. But uh, I think uh, you know having the crowd involved um, is, is important. So the way I think about it is, there's an obvious supply and dis demand mismatch where there are a lot of networks that are launching that are sort of creating space for tens of th for thousands or tens of thousands of validators, and there's maybe 100 credible validator operations in the world right now. So there's that, that supply-demand mismatch creates a significant opportunity. Also, so in, with proof-of-work mining, what you always had to think about, you had to bet on the underlying uh, success of the network, right? Like, if you wanted to mine Bitcoin, you had to bet on the success of Bitcoin itself. With validation, this isn't necessarily true. As a validator, you aren't necessarily betting on a single chain to succeed. You're rather betting on the fact that proof of stake as a whole works, right? Because to you, it's essentially almost, it's not exactly a zero cost thing, but it, like at validating a second network or third network is essentially zero cost to you. So instead of having to bet, unless you need to purchase the underlying staking token, but since most networks have delegation, you can literally run a validation service that isn't exposed to the volatility of the underlying assets, which is sort of nice because at that point, you're just charging a commission rate on top. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about this whole delegation process and like what, 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 do you, what, what exactly this means? Is it, is it like, are you talking about like DPoS, like, like what we saw in BitShares and EOS, or like is it something different? Right. Um, so delegation, um, right? It, it's essentially just that, you know, if you have in proof of work, you want to join a mining pool and you sort of like point your mining power at someone else, at someone else's mining pool. It's sort of similar. It's not exactly like this. As a token holder, you may not have the operational capaci capacity to run a validator yourself, and instead of running one yourself, you have the ability to delegate your tokens to, to delegate your consensus voting power to some other validator. And that person then charges you a fee of providing the service of running the infrastructure for the underlying validator. So would you say that like the validator operations you guys are running are more similar to mining pools then? Like kind of like you're kind of acting sort of as a pool operator, but instead of people like they're sending you their hash power, they're sending you their stake? They're, they're similar. I mean, the, the unique things about delegation are your, your keys stay with you. And so you can assign somebody to be a validator without actually putting your keys in somebody else's hands. You're, you are trusting them that they have to do a good job creating and signing new blocks, but you don't actually have to hand over your keys. And, and so in the mining analog, when you hand over your hash power, you hope that pool is gonna deliver. Here, you can kind of see how people are performing and you're not putting your private keys into somebody else's hand. But in a way, like in proof of stake, if, um, so when I give my stake to someone else, right, they, if they mess up, they can end up uh, usually losing my money that I gave them. But in proof of work, like if I, you know, hash on a, with a certain mining pool and they like propose invalid blocks, at least my ASICs like don't catch on fire or something, right? So this is also a distinct, so when we talk about proof of stake, there are many different variants of proof of stake and Right, they're called N pos, D pos, B pos, <laughs> D pos, whatever. Um, so like this very much depends on which proof of stake algorithm you're actually talking about, right? Like in the, the Tezos case, this is sort of true, where you delegate to someone, and even if I get slashed, or someone delegates to me, even if I get slashed, that person loses nothing. In the Cosmos case, if someone delegates to me and I get slashed, that person gets slashed proportionally. So it all depends on the network we're talking about. I see. Cool. Um, so, but I, I do think. I mean, the point is. Choosing a validator is an incredibly important decision because mm -hmm. your stake, even though you're not giving them the keys, your stake is at risk. And so you have to know they're going to be up 100% of the time and producing blocks, and they're actually taking the right security measures to make sure that their keys mm -hmm. are always, always safe. Yeah, I, th I, th I think the, the operational piece of, 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 um, of, cr of running a validator is like the distinguishing piece that this is like, this is a complicated operational setup that like 
people who have been in this, who have been, who are kind of at the beginning of this space, are investing a lot of time and energy writing software, building DevOps infrastructure, building skills, figuring out how these networks get upgraded, how to deal with the various challenges uh, that are specific to a network. So if I was a delegator and I have a bunch of atoms or tezzies or something, uh, how should I like be a val and I don't want to like run my own op validator operation. Um, what are some of the things I should be looking for when I'm trying to choose a validator? So you mentioned uh, uptime, security. Um, what, what are some other like nice things I should be look in my like holistic rubric or something? Right. Um, so for Cosmos most likely and to some extent also in the future of Polkadot, you probably want to optimize o on security, right? Because your funds are at stake in those networks. So even if you're a delegator, you can get slashed. In something like Tezos, you probably want to optimize for availability uh, because there your funds aren't at stake. So you mostly care about your validator not going down. And then also peculi peculiarity of Tezos is sort of payments don't happen in protocol. So you have to trust your, del your validator to like, pay you at a reasonable rate. Um, so that's like another thing. So it again, it depends on the network, but I think the major two are probably availability and security, depending on whether your funds are at stake or not as a delegator. One thing I'll add is uh, economies of scale. Um, some of these networks, uh, the more liquidity and tokens are consolidated to one validator, um, the more likelihood they have of uh, you know being uh, successful on the network. So that's a something you have to factor in personally as a delegator. Yeah, and then I think you know investors have to deal with things. This is a this is tax, right? This is when you create new blocks, you get income. You actually got to pay tax on that. So, figuring out who's delivering reporting to actually allow you to, you know, pay your taxes and understand how much you're earning on the various things, or this is kind of all the picture of, of what's emerging in the category. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, also one last thing. Uh, there's also a, a bunch of people have started setting up these validators where you have to register with them. Uh, I would personally recommend not to use one of those. I would personally recommend permissionless validators. So sort of like one of the things maybe you should be looking into when you're choosing a validator is like, validators, like an alignment of philosophy almost? Once it comes to governance, certainly. Cool. Um, well, I, I think that's like a good thing. Did you want to segue into the governance question? Um, I had one more question before okay. that. Uh, basically, I wanted to ask like, so, you know, we talked about like measure, like, choosing based off security, right? But like, you know, I feel like even the average staker, coin holder, really like how, if I don't have a background in like security or DevOps or anything, right, or, uh, how do I like even judge the security of a validator? Like, how can I even tell who's a good or bad validator? So we are seeing the beginning of like third party auditing as an eco, sort of coming up in the ecosystem. It's certainly not, going to like sh show up in the next before the end of the year um, I think we have we have sort of one or two services in the cosmos ecosystem that have like stepped up and started providing security recommendations um, we're definitely planning from a tendermint side to communicate more um, about kind of how we think about security validators we have like a whole validator security maturity model um, that we're gonna, that we've been started to communicate about this is a little bit subjective, but um, we'll, at, e at Eon, we'll be making uh, direct uh, token investments. Um, so, you know, we'll be running that ourselves. And so that signals to the crowd, like, hey, we have skin in the game. We're not going to just, like, you know, get you slashed and run away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably for now, skin in the game. Um, besides that, like, figure out who these people are and talk to them and ask them questions. Um, and then over the long run, right, this will eventually show itself who runs running secure operations and available operations. Um, because those that aren't will either go offline or get slashed. Yeah, and the, and the last thing I think is there are people who are doing this work and diligencing validators out there from all the big holders and funds are doing the diligence. So, you know, in a lot of cases, this is going to be a trust business, and you're going to have to figure out if, if people who have hundreds of millions of assets are trusting a set of validators, it's probably a reasonable bet versus two dudes in a server. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that it almost ends up turning into like a combination of like proof of stake and like proof of reputation almost? I think it's going to be a huge trust issue. Yeah. Also, this trust will persist across networks. I think. Um, yeah, which incidentally may secure networks that have nothing at stake, because people that have something at stake on other networks are running those nothing at stake networks. <laughs> but you sort of like get this reputational overlap between the networks. 
Okay. So, um, so I guess segueing into that then, like, how do you as a validator choose what networks you want to validate? Like, you know, uh, do you focus on like one network, put all of your assets on that one blockchain and like, so you can have the highest possible self bond there? Or do you try to like split up your assets across many, run many nodes? Obviously you probably can't run every single blockchain that exists. So how do you choose, pick and choose what to run? So. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, we look at three things. One is the quality of the project. Obviously, is it like a compelling use case? Um, is there a strong community? Uh, you know, is it a strong code base? Um, the second is the economics. Uh, so, you know, is it you know one profitable for us to do? And second, one thing that we've been thinking a lot as we model out um, the financial projections for some of these things is uh, is the market cap strong enough to support healthy inflation? So, you know, there's going to be a lot of you know price shocks in the ecosystem as time moves on and you know that can shake off delegators that can like you know make validators go offline it could make the project less interesting so that's something we were factoring in as well and lastly is um, decentralization uh, because we don't want to get caught up in like a whole oligopoly thing where we have to like you know collude way too much so we work we work with funds and so we basically if a fund tells us they need to us to support something we figure out how to support it um, I think validators are going to have to support everything because I think people are going to want to, you know, you're going to want to make one staking diligence decision and find somebody you trust and so that the person ideally supports everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's possible for validators to um, run many chains, right? Being a validator doesn't necessarily mean that you want, that you expose yourself to the underlying assets. So it doesn't even necessarily even mean that you buy large quantities of the underlying assets that you're mm -hmm. securing there. Um, so correct me if I'm mistaken, but I believe uh, Cryptium Labs is the only one who's currently running a live staker on Tezos network. Uh, oh, you guys are too, okay, cool. Um, and so how did the, okay, so I guess the two of you that decided to run a live staker on Tezos versus the two of you that decided, how, or who decided not to or decided not to yet, how did you make that decision? For us, it was very simple. Our infrastructure was ready. Uh, we have felt very confident. We ran on the better net in Tezos for a while. Um, we looked into the economics of Tezos, and it makes sense. And at the same time, the use case um, is there. And there is a community, like, there is demand for it, most of all. Like, there's demand for someone to secure the Tezos blockchain. And it's like not fundamentally against our philosophy as Cryptium Labs. I think like a phenomenally large amount of Tezos is staked right now. It's roughly 50%. Yeah. Uh, which is con very decent considering other networks. I guess w m my reasoning for, for not um, is like mostly occlusion is focused on Cosmos right now and like we're focused on like the Cosmos network launch um, and so you know you, you only have so many hours in the day. <laughs> basically what it comes down to and like mm -hmm. the Tezos stack is just another stack to get familiar with to build like secure build processes for to figure out HSMs for and like so we'll eventually get to it because ultimately this infrastructure is very fungible but it does take like man hours to mm -hmm. get a good setup going. Yeah for us it's just a timing thing uh, we're building out our platform horizontally and we just want to have our MVP ready for the entire for all the projects we're going to support rather than just like you know being specific on every single project. Um, so I guess uh, going to a point that Zaki was trying to bring up earlier around the concept of governance, right? So what kind of role do you think validators will play in governance? And, you know, maybe how will that role shift over time? Because, like, I feel like in, you know, in the Bitcoin community, we saw the role of miners in governance, like, change rapidly over time. Um, so, yeah, how do you see the role of validators in governance in the short term, medium term, maybe long term? For me, this is one of the things that gets me most excited. Um, you know, for a long time, crypto, um, and even today, in a lot of ways, is still very passive. Um, like for the DAO, the quorum, like you know, it was like 35%. We couldn't even get like 5% on any votes, right? Um, and you know, for Cosmos, for instance, I really love the uh, ability for passive delegators to um, have their vote be represented by your validators, or sort of like your um, constituents, right? And uh, that is what kind of gets me stoked because you know, it, it reminds me a lot of like proxy firms for equities. Um, you know, there's big holders out there that don't necessarily want to get involved with the day-to-day -day governance, and you know, we can become you know, essentially like on-chain like institutions for that that people can look towards. 
There's another model too where we will just run white label technology. I mean, we're the plumbing, and you know, a fund who wants to take an active role in governance can then actually take that active role. Mm -hmm. They may solicit our opinion on technology specific stuff, but they've got a very specific role in uh, the economics or, or specific governance issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think in the short term, validators will be very, very involved with the chains that, well, I, I would hope that most validators will be very involved with the chains they're validating on. Um, it's like very active in the community, is trying to understand what the problems are, where you want to take this technology. Um, and then I think also pro possibly actually contributing code, contributing, let's say, uh, key management solutions or like eclipse protection, eclipse protection tooling, so like, or other sort of tooling around um, the ecosystems they're validating. Mm -hmm. In the long run, my fear will be that due to voter apathy, validators will essentially become these big things that have an undue influence in the governance process simply because delegated, because I think delegation will be very sticky and I think most delegators won't necessarily overwrite their validators' votes. So one of the things I think a lot about regarding governance is like, the validators will have to be very, especially in terms of software upgrades, validators will tend to be very involved. Like, um, you know, Tezos put some software up upgrade capability in, in the uh, chain itself, but like, as a practical matter, validators have had to update in a timely manner uh, in order to upgrade the network. A timely manner means, like, someone pinged a message on Slack, like in a random baking Slack, it was like, guys, there's a new protocol upgrade. Everyone should upgrade. <laughs> in 24 hours, you will drop out of consensus otherwise. Um, and so, and you know, and, uh, and in sort of safety favoring protocols like Tendermint, validators that don't upgrade essentially become a veto on the network um, uh, upgrading. So it, I think the, that just like from a practical operational point of view, especially when these networks are young, the validators will have a lot of influence. And I'm really interested in how governance decisions that affect uh, validator compensation will play out as a result. Um, it's gonna be like a fun thing. Do you th hope, do you think, or do you hope to see that like the role of validators in governance will diminish over time like like th that of miners did, or do you think that in the long term they'll continue to have this like large presence in the, in the governance realm? So I, I think validators should maintain like validators are one of the players in the ecosystem, so they should always mm -hmm. m maintain some sort of role in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. My fears, uh, like my hope, is just that they don't um, sort of form oligopolies and like control these, end up controlling these networks. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the biggest worry. Like I'm not too worried about validators not having any role in in governance. I'm just worried about them having too large of a role in governance. Mm -hmm. And how do you like? you know, keep up with all of the debates and everything, especially as you scale up to more and more chains that you're validating? I'm worried about this. It sounds exhausting. <laughs> um, but I also, I think it's gonna be, I think one of the things that's gonna be interesting is, so like the current generation of protocols is kind of like optimizing for a kind of around 100 validator slots. Um, but like ETH 2.0 and Definity are all in the 10,000-ish validator slots. Um, so, but if there's only like a couple of hundred competent validators in the world, well, then they'll have to fill those slots, and it doesn't really result in that material that much material decentralization. So I'm really interested in like how will this end up working out? Will we end up in a world where like every computer security professional in the world like runs a validator? two on the side, and that might actually be a very decentralized world, and then the role of validators in governance will fall if like validation tends to be like a very specialized business um, where like we only grow this by like an order of magnitude in the next 10 years, um, then validators' role in governance will be large because the scarcity of people to run your software that's different will be, will be limited. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, so you know, we have like a couple of different views of like how the validator space could adopt. There's one which you just mentioned where it's like every security professional is running one and there's like hundreds of thousands of validators. Or you can have it that it's like, you know, mostly startups or that are like doing this, like, you know, most, I think all of us here are like uh, startups or like, you know, a branch of a smaller fund. Or do you see like 
there's a third option where maybe like large established companies in the space start entering. Like imagine like a, a Coinbase or a Binance starts running validators. How do you see that affecting the validator landscape? Um, oh, uh, yeah. So I, I think exchanges are in a prime position to start running validators. It's exactly the same problem set of secure and available keys, right? Like when you think about what an exchange need to be able to, needs to be able to do is withdraw funds when user want, want them. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the same thing as validators. So I think exchanges will play a large part and will also run large validators, mostly because it also offers some interesting economic opportunities around whether they can trade derivatives of the underlying staked asset on their exchanges. Um, so I think exchanges will play a rather large part. Yeah, I mean, think of two exchanges. One pays you 5 to 50% annually on your holdings that you have with them and the one down the line doesn't. It, ultimately, the one that's not paying staking rewards is, is going out of business. And so I, mm. I do think this is, ends up with exchanges, custody providers, and I'm, my belief is there's gonna be a few very large validators that, that run at scale, similar to a Bitmain style approach in the mining world. Um, one of the things I think about uh, to make the case for startups is um, the community. So, you know, I feel like a lot of, you know, people go to exchanges because it has liquidity and the security and the economies of scale, but, um, you know, for this stuff, there's a lot of trust that's involved. And so for us, that's one of the key things we're thinking about is um, our constituents, our delegators, uh, making sure that they feel like, you know, that, that, that they want to delegate to us for a particular reason, yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens when exchanges start offering trading on staked atoms? Or, or sorry, staked tokens, sorry. I, I think in atoms, but like, you know, how does this, I could maybe s trade my like staked atom for your staked Tezzy or something. And how does this even change maybe the s even entire, entire security model of proof of stake? Does it have any effect there? Yeah, I mean, scaled players are gonna get even bigger because if you've got, you know, staked Tezzy's, you got staked atoms, you can swap them for somebody and effectively get rid of your unbonding period. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as those assets never leave the exchange, so as long as we don't actually tokenize the state. So if we create, let's say in the case of atoms, if we create an, like an ESC20 token around of a staked as of a staked atom, I think that's very scary because the economic analysis of how proof of stake gets secured becomes very complicated. As long as it stays within the same exchange and like on Coinbase, I can trade my staked tesis against my staked atoms. That's fine. Like. In the end, I'm still trusting Coinbase. So, like, my f my security model doesn't change. So, um, I mean, ETH 2.0 and like the one protocol people are really excited about, like protocols that allow for staking derivatives um, on chain. Um, and ETH 2.0 will definitely is like the current spec allows for it. So, like, we will see this thing that Adrian is so afraid of relatively soon. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. <laughs> like, you can start shorting. The staked assets and then like start attacking the specific validator who you short, who you shorted. Yeah, because th that creates a world where there's like occlusion atoms and mm -hmm. cryptium atoms. <laughs> I think the dangerous thing though will be once those two assets traded full par and like are the same assets to most people, uh, because then people start ignoring the underlying risk, and that's essentially how we got the financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. It reminds me a lot of like derivatives, and uh, it's good for expansion, but bad for you know a, a beautiful unwinding, as they call it, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so let's move on to a little bit about like the relationships between the people on the stage. Uh, what is the like relationship between validators? Do you see this as an inherently like competitive process, or collaborative, or something in the middle? Uh, frenemies. So, you know, we're, we're all here, make, you know, we want to make sure that the ecosystem thrives. And so we have to, like, you know, be diligent on, on a lot of things. Um, and we have to collaborate, you know, there's going to be a lot of issues where we need to, like, bounce things off each other and, you know, build those relationships, whether that's on the technical side or governance or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's going to be competitive. There's going to be, you know, people are going to be, like, you know, competing for fees. And it's c it could potentially be a really big space, so. I think there are two potential futures here. So one future in which the validators are largely exposed to the underlying asset and are really only validating a single chain. In that case, validators will be very cooperative because no one wants to shoot the guy next to you if shooting him means I'm like risking the reputation of the chain I'm validating. 
if validators aren't that much exposed to the underlying asset, I think it will be, like you said, more frenemies where you can collaborate on certain things. Like, how is this, like, what is the tax implication of a, of a validator, for example? Um, but, like, you compete for delegation on the same scale. So, I think, sort of, at least for the next couple of years, like, it's going to be very friendly because the distribution of all of these staking tokens is highly concentrated among both sort of people who are insiders or closely affiliated with projects and like often common across multiple projects. Like people who own Tezos, Polkadot, Atoms are kind of highly overlapped. Um, and it's gonna take a long time for that to sort of unwind. Um, one of the reasons why Cosmos is running this project called Game of Stakes um, is to simulate what a fully adversarial environment is going to look like, um, at least for a short period of time before we launch the network. Um, and so, like, I'm very curious what that world looks like, but I don't think we'll see it on a main net in, in the near term. Mm -hmm. So if we're a little bit too friendly in the beginning, how do we make sure we're preventing like any sort of collusion or anything like that? Like, do we have me crypto economic mechanisms in place for this? Is it a reputational thing? What safeguards do we have against this? One thing I've been thinking about is just like in general, um, you know, in an open source community, there's uh, there's a lot of scrutiny, right? So I think um, you know if there's some sort of uh, standardization that's implied in which like all the validators have to be radically transparent, um, you know, people that are really passionate in the crowd can you know do their diligence and report on any like malpractice, which we see on some some networks right now. So we built forking tools into Cosmos. Um, to make it possible to fork the network relatively easily, um, and forking is pr sort of our sort of last line of defense against collusion. Mm -hmm. Ooh, cool. Um, and then from the competitive side a little bit. Um, so one of my favorite uh, arguments against proof of stake is this one uh, made by Paul Storsk. Uh, he basically makes this claim that in you know as an operation you. Uh, should basically keep, you have capital and you should spend it until your marginal uh, cost equals your marginal revenue. And he basically makes the claim that in proof of work, this takes the form of miners spending more money on hash power and mining more, which is an inherently constructive process where everyone is like adding to the security of the system. While he says that in proof of stake, validators are gonna spend that excess capital on like sort of attacking other validators, like even like hacking each other, DDoSing each other. Um, so I'm asking you, I guess I'll ask you guys, how are you planning on spending that extra capital? Um, so I think the argument, like his argument is very economic, like very theoretical economics. I don't think that's how it will play out in the real world because I don't think that's how it play, plays out in the proof of work world right now. Um, secondly, even if all validators spend all their access capital on attacking other validators. They add to the security of the network because it means the resilient validators survive. Um, I also think I, what, I ex what I'm hoping to see um, in the validator community is validators having significant amounts of excess capital and using that constructively to like invest more in protocol engineering and increasing the value of their validator operations by making these protocols more useful, which miners do not do really. Well, yeah, actually, it's like this was something that we are now looking into. It's like, um, right, like val what I was saying earlier, validators will end up building tooling around the ecosystem, like releasing, for example, for Tezos, there are currently no, like, not a lot of open source multi sig contracts. So, for like, what we're also doing is we're writing smart contracts for Tezos and like open sourcing them to the ecosystem. So, I guess that's also how we allocate capital here. Okay, that's good to know that you guys aren't planning on attacking each other. I would love to have all this excess capital. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so if you guys aren't planning on attacking each other, but you know there are still malicious so, entities. Somebody out there is going to do it. I mean, it's exactly. worth talking about. The the single biggest motivation to attack a validator is another validator to increase, decrease their reputation and increase yours. Right. And so this is going to happen, and like. Uh, these guys are, are friendly, and, and mm -hmm. I doubt we're going to be attacking each other on stage. There are <laughs> going to be attacks on validators. So yeah. how do you protect against these? Yeah, we. I mean, this is what we worry about all day long. It's about you know how do you stay highly available? We've got mm -hmm. front-end DDoS protection that's just for kind of high-volume stuff. We've got protocol-specific middleware against attacks, and we've got a set of you know basically hidden nodes that we run so that if, if our public infrastructure goes down, 
we can keep up with the chain. Um, and, and, you know, every day it's kind of like, how do you brainstorm about a different way an attack might come? We'll maybe look at one that hits us or hits somebody else and adjust to it. Mm -hmm. Actually, so Tesla saw this attack. So yeah, someone figured right. out um, that you could send, I think, uh, zero, yeah, empty messages, empty transactions to validators and it would crash mm -hmm. the local validator. Mm. Um, and so a bunch of people went down. Um, so like these attacks do happen. They didn't come from another validator, most likely. They came from a developer that like looked at the source code. That's a good point. Do you guys as validators like audit the code bases that you're running? Like, you know, what if you it, you didn't do anything wrong, but the code itself had a bug in it that causes you to double sign and get completely slashed? So is this something that you guys are worried about and thinking about? Yeah, so, so when we build images, um, we actually run them through a scanner for mm -hmm some malicious activity. It's not, it's not gonna catch everything, but there's a pipeline for catching some of that, mm -hmm. and then it's getting mature. Yeah, I, I think there's gonna be an entire sort of ecosystem that comes around, um, also like the validator middleware. Um, some of it will be open source, some of it will be proprietary to validators, uh, where they sort of, mm -hmm. where you build tooling that sort of, you know, understands enough of the protocol to make you, to ensure that like, y your keys aren't misused for double signing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so, do you think that like these security setups, so like, you know, we talked, you, you mentioned about the like DDoS protection with like hidden nodes in the Cosmos ecosystem, we, we have like, we call these sentry nodes. Um, do you think these like validator, the security models are gonna like kind of converge to like, one like one standard or one or two, a few very few standards, or do you think there's going to be a large like stratification of like security techniques? I think it will depend on sort of how much the uh, networks converge on their protocols plus their implementations. Mm -hmm. So if we all converge on lib P2P um, and we're all running that, that means that we can have a very uniform approach to like to protect us on the networking side of things because it's all running the same network instead. I personally hope that's not the case. I hope we remain a very diverse ecosystem. Everyone, every chain has sort of its own implementation because it makes the entire proof of stake ecosystem much more resilient. Cool. And um, so how, and when it comes to, so we talked about the liveness side, what about like the safety side? How, how do you guys make sure your keys are secure? Like, are you looking into specialized hardware? Are you looking into like, are you, how, how exactly are you doing this? So the global HSM situation, hardware security module situation, is not good. Um, essentially, the entire industry has consolidated into a single vendor at this point, uh, Jamalto. Um, and this is suboptimal for running a Byzantine fault tolerant network. Um, so we're really excited about, I'm really excited about pro like all of the projects in this space that are like, oh, we're going to build like a new RISC-V based HSM slash trusted execution environment. Um, but what right now, like uh, I, I'd say, like there's Ledger's products, there's the UBHSM, and there's people who are opting for like Jamalto-based solutions, and there's not a whole hell of a lot else. Mm. Yeah, use HSMs. Remember to back up your keys. Pretty much, mm -hmm. you have cryptographic keys that if you lose them, cost you millions of dollars. You better make sure that you understand against what sort of attacks they're secure. Mm -hmm. At very, very least, do not have this, your keys on the same machine as your validator software is running. Because um, that just makes life, uh, gives you like no defense in depth. Also, don't use cloud HSMs. Like, you're trusting Amazon with your keys. This doesn't seem to be like a great security model. I think, actually, I think fundamentally val most validators should run their own servers in their own data center, which they, where they have total control of the hardware they run. I'd say this is like one of the biggest debates in the validation community is like how much cloud. Um, like there's arguments for lots of cloud, there's arguments for very little cloud, um, and n no one really knows. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I think maybe one last question. Um, so, you know, I guess you could say validators are like, it seems like they're half security company, but also somewhat half like a marketing company in a way, where like like we said, we're kind of competing to earn delegation. And so what are some of the different ways that like, you know, you've been reaching out to delegators or like how, how do delegators find more? I know some, I know Cryptium has been holding like, has held meetups, like live meetups. I know some validators like create like public 
tooling, like Block Explorer, to kind of like get their name out there? What are some of the things that you guys are trying? Uh, like from my perspective, do something useful to the token holder. So like release con like a lot of the token holders don't necessarily have time to dig deep into the source code of like how the proof of stake protocols, for example, work in their specific network. So like digest this for them and tell them about how this works. Like perform a useful function for them. Um, not necessarily related to delegation, but necessarily related to the asset they're holding. For us, our, our core customer is institutional holders of crypto. And so, you know, we focus everything around what does a large fund, an OTC desk, or an exchange need to run a staking operation? And that's, that's kind of, we, we'll talk to anybody, uh, but that's our core kind of sweet spot. For us, since we have like sort of a platform on-ramp, um, we'll have a portal. So it's actually kind of nice in that sense in which um, we're basically going to be using like generalized um, like growth hacking and user acquisition strategies on the web. Um, and that's one thing I'm excited about for validation um, in that respect. Yeah, I think there's going to be an interesting sort of space that is like between like what Staked is doing, which is like very high touch, um, like sort of validation service and like the um, like, oh, well, I'll just go to the crowd. Um, you know, it, it, you know, I think Tezos has like one of probably the broadest distribution of a staking token right now. So it's like appealing to like that kind of a, an audience. I think some of the other staking tokens are more narrowly distributed and are going to start out with a tighter um, sort of valuing high touch businesses, but we'll all probably have to adapt to both. Cool. Um, I think that's all the time we have, but I don't see Anthony yet. So, oh, there he is. Are we out of time? All right. Well, I don't know. I was just going to say, like, no. Does anyone in the audience have any questions that they want to like ask, like about validators? Yeah. Uh, it seems like communication is a big challenge. Uh, not only like just as you said, um, not just between protocols and the delegation services, but delegation services with the delegates. Like, how do you communicate new updates, changes, and what different tools like Telegram, Slack, and so on? Do you like one <laughs> Yeah, for us, uh, again, since we're developing a platform, we'll have a diligence portal. Um, so essentially, our delegates can go up there and we'll provide them with like you know governance updates, um, network health statistics. Uh, so we're, we are planning for to streamline that process for them. Yeah, so we do something very similar. We've got somebody who combs Telegram and Slack and Discord and all these things and tries to figure out you know when updates happen, what are updates to the protocol, and we surface that in our reporting flow. God, I hope not. <laughs> I'm not. Based in Switzerland, we'll mostly be fine. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've actually looked into it quite a bit. Um, so we talked to a firm called DXL Law, where um, they actually pioneered the 2014 um, decision on miners being um, not money um, transmitters. And um, it's still unclear as whether validators will be, because the way they likened it is that like miners are you know, randomly hashing, and it's kind of like mining for gold. You just dig in the ground, right? With validators, there is sort of that concept, but at the same time, like you know, you are like there. There is some certainties if you have enough um, capital and minimum uh, liquidity for some of these protocols, right? So um, TBD. I mean, you know, the government has a lot on their hands right now. So um, just operate. In, we're operating in good faith and doing our best, and see as things develop. Oh yeah, actually, um, work with local regulators wherever you are. Um, that's like they most of them don't understand uh, proof of stake networks yet, and they're very interested in hearing more about it. Um, so like talk to your local regulators and ideally pick a geographic location which isn't necessarily correlated to major economic powers too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually, like, is it open source, first of all? Is it something new, or is it literally a copy of the Ethereum code base with different license files and slap proof of stake on top of it? Um, so, like, looking at, like, is it a reasonable project, really? Like, that's sort of our goal post. Is it something, yeah, like, I also, we also wouldn't run closed source software that's like, 
yeah, run this and like hopefully this isn't malicious and hopefully this will do the right thing. I will run anything my client tells me to run. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.